Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome back to WTFFF in this special series sponsored by HP. I'm Tom Hazard. I'm Tracy Hazard. I think this is just going to be your favorite episode, Tom. I can't imagine why. Because <laughs> we get to talk about your design. Well, and then we finally get to talk about design and color. Well, and, and it's the goods. It's the 3D prints themselves and the capabilities of what you can do with HP's new MultiJet Fusion 3D printer. And I have to tell you, it's really exciting and refreshing what we've been able to do with it and what we're still doing with it. Because even as we're recording this, we're still doing more, more we're testing. We're modifying more again. Things. Yeah, I yeah. mean, what we discovered was that there's a lot of complexities to full color 3D printing. It's just, you know, the design process, it's kind of like starting over again. Like when we started this series, because we thought there's such a steep learning curve that we were going to help people leap that learning curve, right? And, and sort of make steps sort of to advance it. you yeah. yeah by giving you advice on how it works and, it, and designing for color 3d printing is like starting all over again it's definitely a different process and i have to say you know we we have been used to for a decade now right 3d uh, creating models for 3d printing that color is not a part of that tactical process let me put it that way even if we were thinking about what color something might be manufactured in eventually or prototyped in or if we're designing something that is a 3d print end use product which we do we would think about what color it's going to be made in but we were definitely thinking within the limitations of either the processes that were available the manufacturing constraints of production manufacturing down the road after 3D print prototyping, or in the case of 3D print end use product, the vast majority of the processes really allow you to do one color. Right, but you know what? This is so common to the industrial design and product design model in general because, I mean, thinking about injection molding and all of these things, color is always applied later. It's not, it's not designed in from the beginning. So it's very rare that there is something that you have to consider that color application from the moment one. Usually we make prototypes in, in, you know, in our big designs and we'll make, and then we'll paint parts and then we'll go, okay, so we're gonna have to make that part separately, then attach it, snap it in. Like we think about those things or we'll have to mask off and paint differently. Like we think about those things after the fact, not usually it, as a part of the initial design process. For sure. And even when we would have multiple colors within a product, it was usually there are separate parts that are designed and manufactured and assembled. And that's how you get your combination of colors and or you print on things after the fact in a post process, even after injection molding, if need be, or apply right. stickers, decals, whatever. I mean, there's lots of ways that you end up with the final look that you want. But when it comes to 3D printing, we've always wanted to be able to do more with color. Uh, and as we went through this process in providing some prints to HP for some models to HP to print, at first we had gave them models that had no color information in them right? because so our models didn't have color color was done like you said later right so it was like an applied color in process so we've got these like two mic blocks because they're the simplest well, because they're contained you know they're contained uh geometry they're super simple and easy for us to talk about and we use them all the time in our process so we thought okay what what, what how cool would it be but i mean the, theoretically we would really just do them solid in a solid color if we were yeah, molding we wouldn't, them we wouldn't create some kind of a really complex pattern like this on them, you know, right. what's so amazing So for those of is, you who are listening, we basically have what is kind of like a uh, rainbow zebra print. And you can see that it's like applied to the top of it, which nobody really sees because the microphone covers it. So it wouldn't be useful. And then it's drawn out the side, which gives it this sort of rainbow striping look. And so we'll, well have that on fact, the video for in you. In fact, um, some of the green colors on here 
are actually because we use a green screen with our video, you actually can see through it. It's kind of like uh, Steve Carell's pants yeah. and Anchorman or something. Anyway, but, but yeah, so we'll we'll have photos for that on the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com. So you'll be able to take a look at what this is. And you know, while our girls thought it was kind of cool to have rainbow color and everything, it you know, there's going to be very few customers I can think of a, well, a couple who might like that. Let me show, and I hope this doesn't affect the audio too much. But I'm going to bring over our microphone, and you can see this mic flag which is a 3d printed part that is put on the microphone and it we slide a logo card into it for our show we 3d print those routinely um in our our current business but to right. be able to we have had people want ones in color and it's been what kind of color do i happen to have do i have the right color i could never dial in the right color Right. right. And, you know, here's the thing. So we had another one done where they applied color into the center panels, but they get covered by our logo information. Now, reality is, is that, you know, if they could print fine enough, we could print the logos here, but it's really not at that stage yet in 3D printing. So it would be great when we get to that place where we're getting that combination of the, of the HP 2D and 3D together, then we could totally do what we oh, want to do with it. We, at we this could, point. well, we really, we wouldn't have to have a window here yeah. that you slide a card into, right? You could just have it be flat and 3D print it with the logo on it. And you could do that today. But it definitely has a non-glossy finish. I would right. call it a, a slightly, very, very light, soft textured matte finish. But it's really nice. It feels oh, yeah. really smooth. nice and smooth. It's not rough at all. I mean, there. if you look at it really closely, you can see layer lines, but you don't really feel them. Um, and so that's, that's the really nice part about it. But the colors aren't I'm going to call them brilliant. They're not rich and bright, which you get when you have a, uh, a shiny material at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So like when we injection mold something and we, we've got it and it's got that shiny, you know, nylon look, right? This doesn't have that. Or, but or smooth, it's its own style thing, right? Or smooth ABS. I mean, you'd have to like paint this with a gloss paint clear paint finish to get gloss you know and even still the color underneath wouldn't be like deep deep color right so thinking about that you you know these are considerations as to what you can achieve and get out of it as well and, you know but i think in color tom so i mean i've always <laughs> full color 3d printing has been like my dream because right. i i think in color and so from that standpoint this is also something that you as designers out there have to be clear on you're going to have to be very specific with how you specify color and how you identify where it's going to go on your product and how it's going to flow on the product. So we printed, I don't know, hundreds of 3D print ties on different machines over the years. We have. Right? And um, we had like one printed. These right here. Yeah. Yeah, the ones in our, in the background. And we had, you had one printed on, on the machine. Right. Now it's just in gray. It's, it's not just in any- in gray, but we wanted to see the, capabilities of the machine i mean keep in mind when we've printed this in other printers we've had to really you know actually if you look at the video behind us i mean that is an abstraction of the print at the shape it prints in coming off of an FFF 3D printer, right? Right. And we, we, we had to we spiral it in on itself and print it on end on an FFF. So it would fit in the build plate and also it was really complicated. I had to construct my own support material. I couldn't use machine made support to achieve or software made support to achieve what I wanted to. But this is one of the wonderful freedoms of the MJF 3D printer is no support necessary because it's in, you know, a powder bed sort of situation. Right. And the finish is so nice oh on gosh. this one. Like people are really going to be full. It's of actually a lot lighter it's weight lighter. than the, the filament prints we've done with, you know, PLA and ABS and stuff like that. Um, I, I think just the density of the material or the, the, the mass, the weight of the material, something is lighter, which is nice because I've worn these ties at a lot of events, like for like all week long events. And, you know, that's not the lightest tie <laughs> hanging on my shirt there when it's in solid plastic. But with this material, it's, it's actually refreshingly lightweight. But as I got this, we got this sample back. I'm like, 
there was an opportunity we really missed with color. Well, and th this is, there's an opportunity to do something with color, right. which we hadn't planned ahead because we never designed it for that. But the one thing I want to say is that the, t the way the finish feels, this is one thing that people are always asking and coming up to Tom going, can I touch it? What is that when he wears that? And so the material though has this kind of almost like, Oh, it's I don't soft. Know, like, like, like there's silk, like it feels like silk material. It's like fabric in there. That's the texture of the surface, like it raw does feel silk. almost like a fabric surface, texture, like a raw I silk think. texture. And so I think people are going to be really fooled by it and really love that. So we took this gray tie basically and saw how it printed and said, okay, now what are we going to do with this? How well, are we going to take it? And how are we going to do two things? One, because this was always our goal, right? Our always our goal is to make something highly Instagrammable. Right. That yeah. was always our goal from day one. I wouldn't let Tom post anything we did off the 3D printer until I felt it was Instagram worthy. And that being because we're designers, right? It needs to be better than your average. You can't just go out there and post, you know, what, what is it? All the ones that are the pigs and the octopus and the frogs, right? Oh, like, and all oh, the things that everybody. All the typical. All the typical. The you can't little, do that. The little robot. Shots, yeah, you can't the, do that. So, we had yeah. to do something better. And so, that's how the, the tie actually came about, right? Our ties and our angels that we printed over the years. So, thinking about that, we had to say, we have to do the same thing in color. We need to do something that, that you cannot do by any other means. And so, that meant taking advantage of the full color 3d printing capability of doing gradient because being able to go from light to dark or one color to another sounded like an ideal thing for us to, to try because you can't really do that in any other method. There really isn't anything besides painting something right that you yeah. could even do it. And even that is very difficult to do and do it accurately. Um, and then doing like highlighting where we're taking the outside edges of the, of the tie and the inner pieces and changing the colors up in those two areas. You know, long-term we had always thought maybe we might sell the ties or do something where we put um, company colors, a company logos in them. Or even company them. logos or, an, or monogram them, initial right. them, you know. And this you is can more likely do, to do You that. can do stuff like that with this, no question. And, and it was one thing to try to mold those things, or uh, mold is the wrong word, to print in three dimensions those, you know, initials into the print, which was my thinking, you know, years ago. Now I'm thinking, wow, with this technology, you can just print those things on here. And I've had some people, you know, ask about a company logo on them and things like right. that. So that, that can really be done now. But I want to spend a little time talking about technically how to accomplish that. Right. So we don't have a, we don't have the tie as we're recording this. It's being printed. So Tom's got a little bit of a drawing that we'll share on the blog post for the episode. Well, so and you I have a rendering. If you're watching the video, I'm going to at least flash this to you as, yeah. <laughs> as one we've, we've done here. Hopefully you can see we've, we've essentially I've treated the uh, perimeter spaces of the print as one you know, treatment and then the interior spaces as another. And we did do gradients. So I'll talk technically about how I did that in a minute. Right. So just so for those of you listening, it goes from it goes from bright orange at the bottom to a dark red up at the top in the center sections and in the insets of all the tie pieces. And on the outer edges, it does the reversal of that. So it's dark, dark red at the bottom and bright orange up when you get towards the chain at the top. So we've, we've made the gradients go in opposition of each other in the two pieces, hoping that that creates kind of this like energy of it going up and down and which it of course already goes in and out and creating this sort of infinity sort of shape that it does. So we thought this might give it like dynamic energy in the color, in the color choices. Right. And so to describe it to you listening, it's kind of like going from a sunset orange to a deep burgundy red. And, and that's the, the gradient that we applied there. So I want to talk about first some things I tried and didn't achieve what I wanted and then how I achieved what I did. And again, you know, if you go to the blog post at 3dstorepoint.com, I'm going to have really all the images there. You can check it out and you'll, it'll be very clear to you seeing the result. And we'll have photos of the print. The As it, yeah, print. when it comes in, we'll be adding this to the blog post there. Right. So you'll Which be able should to see be that. before yeah. this publishes, I'm hoping. Um, <laughs> if be. it's not, it'll follow it it'll up. It'll be there very but, quickly. But you know, this but, is the thing I just want to say before you get started on this. It was more challenging than you thought, Tom, right? It was much more complex than you thought to just like go well, in and do it. And, and I think that that's important for everyone to say, it's not so easy to modify a model 
and do something that you didn't intend it to do originally. That's a little bit harder than designing from scratch. Like you would design differently. And so if you could talk about those two parts as you're doing it, like how would you have designed it differently to accomplish this? And then how did you have to modify the model? That would be a great viewpoint, I think. Sure, sure. Well, um, first, you know, what I want to share is I, I consulted HP on this. I had a conversation with somebody, uh, not one of the people we interviewed in any of the episodes, but another uh, person on their team about how they would apply color. What would they use? It, you know, because everybody knows who listens to the show, I'm kind of a rhino model guy. I mean, that's my go-to. Not that I'm not very interested to explore newer other programs, but, you know, I, I still primarily use rhino. And while it has rendering capability within it you can apply materials to it and save files out that have material properties within it it's not easy to use it's very difficult and in my application there's something unique about this tie why i really couldn't use uh, rhino's rendering capabilities and material applications to do what i wanted to do and i'll tell you, i'm going to save that for just a minute but what hp said is hey do you have a windows PC machine is like, well, yes, I do. Uh, and we got both here. <laughs> well, because a part of the Windows 10 operating system, now I did find that on my machine, which is an older Windows 10 machine, I had to go to their, um, you know, the Microsoft store and download this free software, but apparently it comes pre installed on a lot of machines called 3D Builder. They also have a program called 3D Paint, and they're very closely related. I, I think they, they actually work together and in, in, in a lot of ways are interchangeable. But uh, HP worked with Microsoft in developing this 3D Builder application, and it will export the 3MF, uh, I believe that's what it's called, um, file format. That is, you know, a format that HP is sort of fostered and prefers, you know, for their 3D printers, although you can still use OBJ and some of the other formats that have material and color information within them uh, for their printers. But I, so I was able to load our model right into the 3D Builder and keep in mind while my tie, uh, hey, let me get that tie again, while the tie is made up of many, many actual separate parts that are interlocked like a chain link, okay? They, it's not one solid thing, it's lots of parts, so you know it moves. But each one of these pieces was one solid model part. And that's important to understand. As it was modeled, I didn't have a different model for this perimeter shape, a different piece of geometry that's separate from what was in the middle, what's in the middle. Because we didn't parts. need it, right? We didn't need it and it complicated it to have it that way even in some of the other methods we were printing things with. So, but this 3D builder software and this 3D paint application would allow me to apply either texture maps or um, actually paint and in different areas. Like it would treat each different surface of the model as its own element and allow you to apply color just to that element. And you could either apply it as a block of color or they have some brush effects where you could create, you know, like you're painting with a brush and putting more paint in part of the surface and less in another part of the surface. I mean, you could really get very detailed with it if you want to. Um, the, the thing that I found about that software though, with such a complex model like this tie that has literally, you know, I think about a hundred separate little pieces of geometry in it that, it was very time consuming yeah. <laughs> to, to, to apply those um, colors to it and doing any kind of a consistent gradient across multiple pieces was very challenging. So I don't know that, that that program was the best application to achieve what we wanted to, although I did take time and I have a screenshot in the, um, I'll have in the blog post showing you what I was working on in this 3D Builder program. But I think for many, models that maybe have fewer parts are less complex and you want to apply colors or textures to them this is a very simple utility that you could take a rhino model or any kind of what you've probably heard me say in the past when it's not a parametric model i, I call it like a dumb solid so any kind of dumb closed solid meaning pure 3d geometry that you want to apply 
texture and or um, you know color to you absolutely uh, can do that with this program and and it's it's fairly fairly simple and straightforward to learn how to use didn't take a lot of work well i'm glad you're sharing your work process with everyone so that they can see what what works and what didn't work and this is kind of like the early days of 3d printing again right like so we're going through and we're it's trial and error to be able to achieve what's in your head right and that's right. you know that's really what we've been talking about in this whole series here is like how can we get faster through that process um i mean maybe it would have been a lot of fun to use vr in that process <laughs> well maybe maybe yeah. but what i found though what I needed to do to get the kind of result we wanted, which is the image we showed a few minutes ago and what you'll see in the blog post where we really could apply color very precisely and quickly across many, many different pieces of geometry. What I needed to do is I actually recreated in the exact same geometry though, right? Cause I, you know, I save all my work and all the generations of what I did. Um, I, recreated the tie so that each of those sort of twisting infinity shapes that are the more flowing plane of surface in each tie were separate actual models from the perimeter you know structures it's like a three millimeter extruded circle going around the path of stuff so um, I, I recreated all those pieces and then I could apply textures or colors not only very definitively and differently between them. But then um, I went to a different program because one of the things when we decided, well, you could apply solid color pretty easily to them just there, but we wanted to do a gradient. So I created my own bitmap essentially in Photoshop of the gradient from that orange color to the red color that I wanted and pretty much the proportion or scale of, of, all the parts because it's close long to and it. skinny right? long and skinny just close to it anyway right uh didn't have to be exact it's not super precise but then i needed to use a program that would let me apply that texture map across all the parts that i wanted to together and not just individually because i wanted the gradient to really be even and smooth across all of them so I went to um, Autodesk 3D Studio Max, which is one of the programs I have that's, you know, my typical rendering program. And it allows me to group as many parts as I want and apply a texture map to the group as a whole, not just to each individual part. And so then I could do that gradient. So I, let's say it took all the, the middle fill parts all the way through the tie, grouped them together and applied it. And then, to, so to the middle from orange to red and then to do the inverse i grouped all the outer perimeter parts in one group and then i turned the bitmap 180 degrees so that it was red at the bottom going to orange at the top which is the opposite of what was happening in the middle parts and so you get this really nice contrast at the top and the bottom of the tie and there's somewhere in the middle where it's almost the same color in both and you sort of it's like it's traveling and switching and blending and so well, I found and, that and this is something to consider that you could do and that you can stretch one and so you could have played with the, the idea right. of them not blending into the center because you may find out if you were if you had the ability to test and print and test and print right like and go back and forth then you may find out that it may create a stripe across the center that is undesirable it may also look really cool. So you know, we don't know. So this is something that you know we'll we'll be trying. We'll see how it is. It may not be exactly what we imagined because it may be that one of those directions has to travel at a different pace of light to dark or orange to red in this case. But I, I found that dealing with you know there, I'm sure like with most things in creating models and renderings, there's a dozen different ways to accomplish any one task. And, you know, some may be more efficient than others. Uh, some may have more possibilities and capabilities than others, but there's a lot of ways to do it. And for me, I just found that uh, using a program I was a little familiar with and I knew I could apply the textures the way I wanted and 3D Studio Max made sense. Uh, but the reality is um, any program that can output that surface color material with the model is critical. And so that's what I did. I exported a a, a different model, not from my main CAD program, from the rendering program that includes the bitmap information, the textures. And that's really 
what that HP printer will read and it's going to build the model and apply the color. And I have to say, Tracy, with that, get that little mic flag again, with one of the things that this shows us, and for those of you listening, I'm again holding up a model in the video you might want to check out, but there is not a surface on the outside of this part that is not colored and printed with color from a map. It's incredibly capable. It doesn't matter what orientation the surface is in, you know, what axis it's in. I don't know how this printer does it, but it's pretty darned impressive that you can get color everywhere. Well, another thing that we were going to do is we were going to, uh, although our children weren't going to be too happy, so maybe we'll saw this one apart, the one okay. with the solid panels. But we're going to saw it apart, so we're going to break it apart so you can see how deep the color goes in. You can you can kind of tell that it's pretty surface, um, and it's very thinly on the surface, but we'll, we'll cut that apart, and we'll have that in the video as well. I mean, in the... Uh, blog post for the episode as well. So you can take a look at that and sort of see the depth of that. Because I mean, that's really efficient use of color, efficient use of what they're doing. And they start with this more gray stock material. It's not white, it's not black, because it takes the color better. But it is partially why the colors have those sort of pastel-y kind of um, muted quality. And it's because the material starts in that gray. A pastel is a good way to describe yeah. it, Tracy, actually. Yeah. But I'll tell you, incredibly professional you could create a very very professional 3d printed models samples test samples whatever with full color the way that you would like it to be in production maybe with the exception of the glossiness other than that I'm I'm really excited about this, Tracy. I, I mean, know it's, it's it may, a real game changer. It is. It makes it, it goes back to what we always thought we could achieve and was never able to earlier on, and so it's come so far. Um, full color 3D printing is really here, and it's going to only get better from here because I'm very sure with the way that they modeled and everything that we've learned from the whole process of of doing all the interviews here and sort of learning through all the different stages of their company and HP as a whole in their sort of work process and their workflow with everything, there's going to be great improvements. They're going to model exactly the same process that they took with their 2D business. And so the colors are going to get more brilliant. They're going to get more accurate. The print's going to get finer. It's going to, you know, all of those things are really on its way. Now we just have to learn for, to design for it, right? That's our job. And the next generations of, of industrial and product designers out there need to start designing for full color 3D printing. And I think as long as you under you experiment and you understand the principles and what can be done, then you'll consider that more as you're creating the models from exactly. the beginning and be thinking about color earlier on. And it won't be so much of an afterthought. And you won't have to reconstruct your model the way I did with this tie to be able <laughs> to right. apply it. Because that, that took me, I don't know, several hours, you know. Yeah. So anyway, I'm super excited about um, you all seeing the photos from this. So please go to the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com. And you know, we're getting towards the close of this series and we've got a few more really great episodes that are really talking about application and use. So, you know, so we're getting past the design process and getting into this application and use of, of 3D printing. And um, I'm really excited about that. So there's a few more coming up. Don't miss them. If you haven't uh, caught the whole series and you want to know what's in it, you can go to 3 dstartpoint dot com forward slash hp and you'll be able to catch that whole series awesome well hey thanks for listening everybody i hope you enjoyed it and definitely hope you like the photos and everything at the blog post or the video if you're listening to the audio go check it out thanks very much everyone this is tom and tracy on wtff thanks for listening to the wtff special series brought to you by the z and 3d print teams from hp you can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D.